Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the National Television Network live broadcast of Parliament for today, Tuesday, April 21, 2020. I am Primus Hutchinson. The motion before the House, been debated before the House by the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs, and the Public Service, is that it be resolved. Parliament extends for an additional period commencing from the 27th of April 2020 and ending on the 31st day of May 2020 in accordance with Section 17 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 1.01, the Constitution of St. Lucia, Resolution of Parliament approving Declaration of State of Emergency passed as statutory instrument number 40 of 2020 and that approved the state of emergency that was published in the Gazette uh, on the 23rd day of March 2020 as statutory instrument number 39 of 2020 containing a declaration that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019 uh, of an infectious 2019 COVID, an infectious disease commonly known as COVID-19 for a further period of 26 days commencing from the 31st day of March 2020 and ending on the 26th day of April 2020. Bills by the Honorable Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs and the Public Service the National Insurance Corporation Amendment for, is down for first reading. Regarding the extension of resolution of Parliament approving declaration of state of emergency, whereas it is provided by Section 17 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 1.01, that the Governor General may, by proclamation, which shall be published in the Gazette, declare that a state of emergency exists for the purpose of Chapter 1 of Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 1.01. And whereas it is further provided by Section 17.3 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 1.01, that the declaration of emergency shall lapse. A, in the case of declaration made when Parliament is sitting at the expiration of a period of seven days beginning with the date of publication of the declaration and b in other case at the expiration of a period of 21 days beginning with the date of publication of the declaration unless it has in the meantime been approved by resolution of the senate and the house and whereas it is further provided by section 17.6 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Cap 1.01, that A, the resolution of the Senate of the House pass for the purposes of Section 17 shall remain in force for 12 months, as such short a period as may be specified in the resolution, and B, a resolution on the paragraph A may be extended from time to time by a further resolution, each extension not exceeding 12 months from the date of the resolution effecting the extension. And whereas the Governor General by proclamation declared a state of emergency that was published in the Gazette on the 23rd day of March 2020 as statutory instrument number 39 of 2020 containing a declaration that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019 COVID, an infectious disease commonly known as COVID-19. And whereas the declaration of emergency is made when Parliament is sitting and will expire at the end of a period of seven days beginning with the set of publication on the declaration unless the declaration is approved by resolution in the Senate and the House. And uh, whereas Parliament approved the declaration of state of emergency that was published in the Gazette on the 23rd day of March 2020 as 
Statutory Instrument Number 39 of 2020, containing a declaration that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019 COVID and infectious disease, commonly known as COVID-19, for a further period of 26 days, commencing from the 31st day of March 2020 and ending on the 26th day of April 2020 by the Constitution of St. Lucia, Resolution of Parliament, approving declaration of state of emergency passed on such a resolution number 40 Now the Sergeant of Arms is about to make his entrance, followed by the Speaker of the House for the commencement of this afternoon session. Honorable members, please be reminded that the question before the Parliament is that Parliament extends for an additional period commencing from the 27th day of April 2020 and ending on the 41st day of May 2020 in accordance with Section 76 of the Constitution of St. Lucia, Chapter 1.01, .01, the Constitution of St. Lucia, Resolution of Parliament approving declaration of state of emergency. Pass as statutory instrument number 40 of 2020 that approved the state of emergency that was published in the Gazette on the 23rd day of March 2020 as instrument number number 49 of 2020, containing a declaration that a public emergency has arisen as a result of the occurrence of 2019. NCOV, an infectious disease commonly known as COVID-19, for a further period of 26 days, commencing from the 41st day of March 2020 and ending on the 26th day of April 2020. Before I call on the Honorable Prime Minister, let me remind Honorable Members that um, I'm not saying we have a cut-off point, but technically, curfew starts at 7. I just want to bring it to your attention in case that we... So whatever we do, let's see how we could. Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I would have hoped a man in your position would have known somebody that you could have arranged for us to be able to stay after hours. But... <laughs> So, Mr. Speaker, um, I just want, uh, before I give my, uh, my formal rebuttal, um, I just really wanted to be able to answer some of the issues that were brought up by members on the opposite side. Um, it was said that um, if things are getting better, why would we need to extend the um, curfew? And I think that I tried to cover that in, 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 in my opening remarks, that while things look like they're getting better, and while certainly the numbers of incidences that we've had would suggest, suggest that there is not a community outbreak, that COVID sadly is a virus that can suddenly take over. And I, and I look at some of our sister islands, and I really don't like making comparisons between one country and the other country because we're really very different, but just um, the, what happened in Jamaica with the call centers is a, is a good example where Jamaica was really doing exemplary work. I know how hard the Minister of Health, uh, Chris Dufton, um, had worked and the sacrifices that Jamaica had made. And then all of a sudden they went from, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, something like 60 cases to over 200 cases in less than one week. We've seen in Singapore, where Singapore was doing an amazing job and all of a sudden there was an outbreak um, because of the workers that were coming in from Malaysia. And then even in, in Sweden, I think it was, where everybody was 
talking about how great Sweden was doing, what a great job that they had been doing, and all of a sudden, literally in two weeks, they got substantial numbers. So I just want to remind all solutions that we are a long ways away from being out of COVID. Um, certainly you just have to turn on your TV and look at what's taking place just in the United States of America, other countries here in the Caribbean, and understand that it's still a very much uh, a strong virus and one that poses threats to us and that while what we've been doing has been working, this can change overnight. I mean, our borders, as we all know, are vulnerable. And solutions wanting to come home from Martinique or even some of our fishermen deciding that they don't want to fish for fish and want to go and fish for something else in Martinique could, by accident, come back with the disease or the virus. So I want to say to you, we're not out of the woods. And what I in explained, and hopefully um, in my opening um, introduction of this, of this motion, Mr. Speaker, was when I described um, what government has to do, not a light switch. It's not like black or white. And that's why I use the example that the governor from California used, where he talked about a dimmer switch and that you're constantly trying to find where that level is. And it's that nuance of having to change times of the curfew, change the list of persons that you want to, or businesses that you want to be open, that flexibility that the emergency um, uh, uh, authority allows a government to be able to do. I, I would like to think, more than think, I would say to you that I do not believe there's been any abuse of authority on this side. Um, I appreciate the comments of members on the other side. I certainly want to apologize to you if in any way that members on the opposite side, Mr. Speaker, believe that we're trying to silence them. I mean, that's what democracy is. It's what we stand for. And we stand for it very much in our own party every single day. We see individuals here on this side as being very strong and capable persons and certainly the way that we conduct the business in cabinet, we, the way we conduct business even our own party affairs, we're very familiar with democracy and the right of individuals to speak and we're also cognizant of the fact that those differences of opinions are the ones that strengthen the final decision that you make. What you don't want is to be in a room where everybody starts sounding and looking and behaving the same. And we keep reminding each other that our obligation is to represent our constituencies, to represent all of the people in this country, and to the best of our ability to recognize everything that we're doing in terms of how it's going to affect people. So there is a real need to continue the uh, emergency um, authority to continue to give the government the flexibility to impose the necessary legislations, amend acts um, that will re redound to the saving lives. Saving lives, because that's ultimately what this has always been about. In terms of the Nemo distribution, um, the leader of the opposition and I had um, a discussion, and, and certainly let me also, Mr. Speaker, um, I'd, I'd spoken to the, the, the leader um, of the opposition. Um, I had invited him to be part of a private sector council meeting um, where the Ministry of Finance gave very detailed um, description of the current financial situation. Um, and unfortunately, the uh, Ministry of Finance did not get him the link. Um, he and I have spoken since then. I have apologized to him. I'm apologizing publicly. I also want to say that um, I have passed on, I believe he's received it, the number for the Director of Finance. Um, and I've asked the Director of Finance to coordinate with him and his side um, for them to be able to get uh, their own presentation. And also what we have asked to do... Sorry? Um, we also asked um, that the 
opposition will be put on a subcommittee that's being formed, an economic recovery subcommittee that includes the private sector groups and will include the unions, uh, will include the, the opposition in terms of looking at how do we recover from this devastating um, hurricane called COVID. In terms of, of NEMO and what took place at NEMO, you know, I was really very, very surprised, I have to be honest with you, Mr. Speaker, that after all the disasters that we have had, that one would have imagined that the list of the poor, the, the vulnerable list or the poverty list that we have, and I, and I want to say something that's very clear. The poverty list is not a complete list of all the poor people in Saint Lucia. And we've lamented that. We've, we've put that that's a problem. It's, it's, a, it's a poverty list in which people have been put on and it is a maximum number to the dollars that we can spend, whatever the allocation is. And so in addition to the poverty list, there is what's called a standby list of persons waiting. So the poverty list today is currently made up of 2,700 people, 2,400 people. And the standby list has another 600 people on that list. So, I never imagined, Mr. Speaker, that Nemo would not have had that list. So all the time when we're here talking about the poverty list, the poverty list, I thought that was a pretty simple list to be had, to only find out that the Ministry of Equity um, had difficulties in releasing the list on the basis they did not want to invade people's privacy. And so equity wanted the, the baskets, in essence, to be sent to equity. And the operations at NEMO, that they also have a very close relationship, as we all would imagine in the time of a hurricane, with the Red Cross. And so Red Cross has its list, and then they also work with the churches. And the churches had their list. And so it was really not until halfway through the distribution that this information was made available to me and I put a stop on all delivery of goods and so that's why again some members on the opposite side and also members on this side had complained that days afterwards that baskets had not been delivered as yet and it was to make sure that there was um, a no duplication, or if there was duplication, to make sure that everybody who was on the poverty list also got done. The other difficulty we had, and one of the members of the other side uh, made mention of it, um, that under NEMO there are what's called um, these uh, disaster committees. And so these disaster committees exist at a, at a local level, and that they have their own chairperson, and members to that committee but because we didn't really have an, a hurricane the disaster committees never were really implemented and so when there was complications in the distribution that um, the disaster committees were waiting for the goods but they themselves um, didn't have the manpower to do the distribution but furthermore when Nemo was having difficulties in getting Mr. Speaker the poverty list, Nemo turned around and asked the disaster groups to provide them with names. So it's at that point, Mr. Speaker, that we intervened and what we did because of the uniqueness of this situation is combine the town councils, the disasters groups, as well as the welfare officer for each of the districts to make up the committee. And eventually we're able to get them the poverty list plus the persons waiting on the poverty list. So um, I have spoken to the, the leader of the opposition about it. Um, I also believe, if I'm not mistaken, I could stand to be corrected, that the uh, director of NEMO also gave a full report and account of the distribution of the baskets. Um, I believe she did it on NTN, and if I'm not mistaken, she has a written report. If she does not have a written report, Mr. Speaker, I assure you at the next sitting of the House that we will have it and we will make it a document